Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Payer Success Demands Data Using Claims Information to Your Advantage, presented by LexisNexis Risk Solutions Healthcare. Before we launch into the main presentation, I'd like to go over just a few brief details. First, today's event will be about an hour long and we'll be recording it. We'll also email you a link to the archive recording so you can view the presentation again later if you like or share it with your colleagues. Please disable any pop-up blockers to ensure you have no trouble viewing the slides or the links in today's event. This is an interactive event. Please feel free to submit the questions to our speakers using the chat box on your screen. If you would like to enlarge the slides, you may also do so by dragging the corner of the box. This function allows you to make the, the slides larger or smaller. All the widgets are also resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. Please take a moment to visit our resource center. The box is located on your console. Here you can access a number of resources that you might find helpful. If you have any technical difficulties during the webinar that I haven't covered, clear your cache and refresh your browser link and refresh your console. If that doesn't work, please feel free to reach out using the Q&A box. Finally, at the end of this event, we'll present you with a survey. Please take a few minutes to fill it out and let us know your thoughts. For today's webinar, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers, Rebecca Haupt and Sean Larson. Rebecca serves as a manager of healthcare strategy for LexisNexis Claims Analytics Solutions. In her role, Rebecca serves as an industry subject matter expert, working to set the product suite roadmap and vision, engaging with cross-functional teams to identify potential enhancements and new products, evaluating market opportunities and conducting market sizing and building documentation to support the go-to-market process. Rebecca is a key contributor for MarketView's innovation and strategy, bringing to bear her experience in Medicaid claims data sets, behavioral healthcare performance measurements, and monitoring, data collections, analysis, and visualization, managed care readiness, and value-based payment principles, and direct care experience in both the addiction and mental health fields. Rebecca holds a Master's of Public Administration from Cornell University, as well as a Bachelor's of Art from the State University in New York. Sean Larson serves as the Senior Director of Healthcare Strategy for LexisNexis Claims Analytics Solutions. Sean has more than 24 years of experience developing database solutions, selling models, and advanced data mining solutions for both B2B and B2C. Prior to LexisNexis, Sean spent 11 years with Medtronic leading the business insights and analytics teams focused on building internal and external stakeholder deliverables that increase growth or reduce costs by optimizing people, processes, technology, and data, including global data acquisition, data management, predictive, and prescriptive analytics. Sean has a BA in finance from the University of St. Thomas, an MS in statistics from Stanford University, and an MBA from the University of Minnesota. Team, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chima. Uh, well, thank you and uh, welcome to all uh, for spending the next hour with us today. Um, as you all know, healthcare is a constantly evolving and shifting market. Influenced by policy and regulation, and it's a landscape of big but sensitive data. And in recent years, under constant pressure to reduce costs and show greater quality outcomes. We at LexisNexis strive to help our customers navigate this ever-changing landscape by leveraging insights generated from over 2.2 billion consolidated, submitted and remitted claims from 165 million plus unique patients. Today, we're going to share where we see industry trends leading, shifts in how patients are cared for, accelerated by COVID-19, and results of our most recent payer pulse survey, and where data plays a critical role in managing your business. So, let's start by discussing the state of the industry. Over the next few slides, we will discuss these and other industry trends that are shaping our landscape. First, as you all know, the market has been shifting from volume to value. With the emergence of alternative payment methods, or APMs, indicative of value-based care approaches. And to level set, 10 years ago, healthcare insurance was paid on volumes. Over the past decade, we've seen a shift from the number of services to the quality of those interactions. With market attention driving an increase in accountability, 
Volume-based reimbursements are still commonplace, but we are seeing a shift towards a value-based model. In the market today, we see four major categories of payment models. The first are your traditional fee-for-service payments. These are not linked to quality. They're not adjusted to account for either infrastructure, investments, provider reporting, or data quality. Uh, and or quality metrics. The next are fee-for-service payments, but they are linked to some sort of quality. Payments adjusted based on infrastructure investments to improve care or clinical services, whether providers report quality data or how well providers perform on cost and quality metrics. Third, are the payment models built on fee-for-service architecture, providing mechanisms for effective management of a set of procedures, an episode of care, or all health services provided for individuals. These track cost and performance and hold providers financially accountable for performance on appropriate care measures. This is where we start to see upside rewards for appropriate care. And then lastly, our population-based payments, providing our driving providers to deliver person-centered care these payments hold providers accountable for quality and person-centered care goals, including preventative health, health maintenance, health improvement, and acute or chronic care services. Of these categories, APMs account for 35% of payments, but represent 77% of the covered population, roughly 226 million Americans. This shift represents a high percentage of payments. The fee-for-service decline is already underway, seeing a 2% decline since last year alone, with many industry goals to see alternative payment models grow to 50% or more within the next five years. In addition to the shift from volume to value, we are also experiencing a shift towards patient responsibility. Patients are charged with greater ownership of the financial burden for their health care. This is hallmarked from a shift from PPO to high deductible plans. Employers are seen to be lowering costs while increasing monthly patient insurance costs. The result of this Patients are paying more out of pocket, and this is changing their buying behaviors and decisions. If you look at the graph on the right, you'll see that in a survey from Bloomberg, the percentage of Americans who have moved from high deductible plans has grown considerably since 2010. Thank you, Sean. So as, as patients are more responsible for their health care costs, and I'm hearing a little bit of an echo of the one thing you should have um, As patients are more responsible for their health care costs, there's really an increased need for price transparency. Um, in, tw in 2019, we saw the execution of a presidential order requiring hospitals to publish prices that reflect what people pay for services. Um, this action really went you know, a step beyond what had been started through the ACA's requirement for hospitals to publish standard prices on the internet. Um, it's designed to increase price transparency and thus better consumer decision making. Um, while the spirit of these efforts is to make costs more patient accessible, um, their execution has been poor historically. So hospitals address this need um, by making their charge masters available online. These are really not easily searchable. They can be hundreds of pages long. They can cost difficult to decipher for even you know, a skilled consumer. Um, what you see on the screen is really just an example from a hospital that had, you know, 456, you know, pages on their website of their charge masters, which is not, not user friendly, right? Not good for consumers to really figure out what the price is for their care. Um, as of January 1st this year, um, the hospital price transparency final rule went into effect. This final rule requires hospitals to make their standard charges public in two ways. Um, it has to be a comprehensive machine readable file, and it has to display um, the shoppable services, so a list of key shoppable services in a consumer-friendly manner, essentially making standard charge public. Um, a standard charge means the regular rate established by the hospital for an item or service provided to a specific group of paying patients. Um, 
And when we're talking about these standard charges, really the five types that they're talking about are the gross charge, the discounted cash price, the payer specific negotiated charge, um, the de-identified minimum negotiated charge, and the de-identified maximum negotiated charge. Um, additionally, the payer price transparency rule um, is set to go into effect in 2022 uh, with a phased approach over the next few years. So in 2022, similar to the hospital price transparency rule, um, health plans will need to make public in a standardized, regularly updated, easy to consume file, the enrollee cost sharing for healthcare services and disclose the rates paid to healthcare providers for specific services. Um, in 2023, that's currently the current rollout, um, health plans will need to provide an online shopping tool that allows for consumers to see their negotiated rate between their provider and their plan, um, as well as get a personalized estimate of their out-of-pocket costs for um, 500 of the most shoppable items and services. And then in 2024, these you know, tools are really going to need to expand to show costs for remaining procedures, drugs, or durable medical equipment. So both of these price transparency rules for hospitals and payers are intended to empower consumers to shop and compare costs between specific providers before receiving care, which really brings us to our next trend, um, consumerism. So when we talk about consumerism, what we really mean is patients are shopping for healthcare. Where can they get the best value at the best price? Um, and they need price transparency to be able to make informed decisions on their care. Um, as you're all aware, consumers are now looking at the cost of an MRI before deciding which imaging center to go to. They're looking at the cost of a knee replacement before deciding which surgeon to see. They're looking at the cost of infusion therapy before deciding where to receive their care. The combination of all these industry trends really comes full circle to consumerism. Um, capturing that consumer mind share and preference is critical for successful market penetration and product adoption. Um, this highlights the need to effectively gain consumer mind share and keep their interactions and associations with you positive. Um, in the age of consumerism, you know, our industry's diverse provider ecosystem offers individuals a lot of choices um, with eight and a half million practitioners. Um, I think I said this. Yeah. Uh, consumers can really pick when, where, and from whom they'll receive their services. In many ways, healthcare services are becoming more and more like a shopping mall, right? With consumers picking and choosing who they want to manage their healthcare and why. Um, effective patient engagement is a critical step to not only gain, but keep their attention. Um, so I'll share an example. My sister recently had a baby, her third, um, and so as a family of five, they chose to go to the provider system that, had, that they had such positive experiences with for their first two deliveries. This healthcare system is also where they go for their pediatrician, women's health, imaging, you name it. This healthcare system earned their loyalty by how they treated them during their deliveries. Um, at the same time, they changed their health insurance provider moved to a high deductible plan and started to evaluate the cost of health care as well as their preferred health care system. So really they wanted to make sure that their new insurance plan covered their preferred providers in network at a reasonable cost. So all of this really starts with patient engagement, right? So engagement enrolls not only the patient but their families to become invested in their health outcomes. Patient experience results in high levels of clinical outcomes. Those with increased engagement see significant declines with common challenges such as medication errors, falls, length of stay. Um, perhaps the, uh, one of the most important aspects of patient engagement is a happy consumer is more likely to stay. Um, with each patient having a rough lifetime value of you know, $1.4 million to a healthcare organization, positive patient experiences will influence their choices um, for health services for years to come. So what does this mean for you, right? You want your product design, your provider mix, your ancillary services to garner a positive patient experience, um, to help capture that loyalty to your plan. You wanna make sure the providers or consumers are loyal to are in network and costs are clear and reasonably priced. Um, so that brings us to our first poll question. So um, time for some interactive experience here. So we're just gonna pause, which of the industry trends um, were of the greatest focus to you prior to COVID-19? Because we are going to cover COVID-19 um, in a moment as far as new trends um, that are also popular, you know, we're all seeing. But pre-COVID, what was most important um, for, for your organization? Adoption of alternate payment models, APM, designing plans with greater deductible options, meeting the new price transparency requirements, or increasing patient engagement and keeping them in network? And we'll give you about... Uh, 10 more seconds to make a choice here. Okay. I'm going to go to the next slide, and I believe that will close out the 
Okay. So we see, there might be a little bit of a delay here, but we do see some answers here. So what we are seeing on the screen, I hope you are seeing it, is 23.5% said adoption of um, APM was most important pre-COVID. 6% uh, said designing plans with greater deductible options was most important. 17.5% um, said meeting the new price transparency requirements was most important. And uh, about 53%, so certainly the majority here, are saying uh, increasing patient engagement and keeping them in network was top priority um, for you before. Now, I'll, I'll speak and I'll see if Sean has any thoughts about this. This is not surprising, right? When we know that the uh, value of having a consumer who's engaged, um, who's engaged in their healthcare, who's engaged in their plan, keeping them in network um, is really good for uh, your bottom line, but also really good for their healthcare when, when you're able to provide kind of that breadth of services. So that doesn't um, surprise me terribly. And I, I do believe that we're starting to see the new price transparency requirements um, become more and more uh, something that was a top priority um, based on some, you know, you know, polls that we've done um, earlier in the year. We kind of know this is a, a growing um, trend here. Uh, Sean, did you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I would agree. I think uh, pricing transparency is going to be top of mind as we get closer uh, to the rule being in, in effect. And I think that these trends uh, that we, the other trends that we see are trends that have been happening and, you know, the industry has been slowly shifting uh, and then COVID has exacerbated some of those shifts moving forward. I think we are all feeling uh, those impacts of, of uh, the pandemic from COVID-19. In the past year, uh, we've seen population across the globe being impacted. And the pandemic has uh, characteristics and trends that distinguish it from others uh, in this modern time. I mean, some of the, some of the things uh, such as high mortality for elderly populations and those with more than one chronic comorbidity. Uh, it's a highly infectious uh, virus with longer incubation periods causing significant spread and from unsuspecting and asymptomatic uh, individuals. Now we've seen a very high demand for sh and shortage of critical life supporting equipment like ventilators, respirators, dialysis machines, ICU care levels, as well as the need for uh, skilled and uh, critical care personnel. Since 2005, we've also seen a steady trend in procedures moving to ambulatory surgery centers. Since COVID-19, we've seen an increase in that trend, movement from uh, ambulatory to ambulatory surgery centers. Understanding where this mar where the market procedures are shifting will help you in ensuring that you're contracting appropriately with those treating patients. And remember that an ASC could be part of an IDM, could be independently owned or hybrid. So understanding what is happening with those disease states in your market will make you more effective at managing those patients. on COVID, uh, COVID mor morbidity and mortality. And as part of the U.S. population began falling ill, uh, additional data suggest higher correlations to specific underlying conditions. While everyone is at risk for COVID-19, the CDC has indicated that older individuals and individuals with serious underlying uh, medical conditions may be at higher risk for severe illness. So as a result, we looked at high-risk populations and we focused on the proportion of the county whose population is 60 years or older and who have two or more high-risk comorbidities. The specific high-risk comorbidities included in the data model are based on a review of relevant market literature, clinical guidance, and CDC recommendations. High-risk comorbidities include 
included in the analysis you see here are asthma, cancer, chronic lung disease, coronary artery disease, diabetes, heart failure, hypertension, liver disease, renal failure, and HIV AIDS. We later went back and added risk, uh, health risks by age and condition to provide targeted view of specific high-risk comorbidities. The health risks included in the data model, again, look at those over 60, but this time with one significant underlying condition elevating their level of risk. Among many high-risk comorbidities, we chose to further segment by age and condition, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, lung disease, age and heart disease, including heart conditions such as coronary disease and heart failure, age and diabetes, including diabetic conditions such as type 1 and type 2 diabetes, age and hypertension, including various high blood pressure diagnoses, and age and lung disease, including chronic lung conditions such as asthma, COPD, and emphysema. The third vulnerable population we chose to evaluate were those with socioeconomic risk factors. We included our socioeconomic health attributes related primarily to economic stability factors, such as housing stability and financial health indicators. Our goal was to include that these, to help public health officials understand which communities they may have the greatest need for social and economic support right now, and whose socioeconomic needs, if left unaddressed, are more likely to prevent optimal health outcomes. Much of what we discussed to this point is about population health, how to be trained to impact a pay for value, how social determinants of health are a key ingredient to understand and prioritize resources on risky populations, along with understanding who your movers that can impact clinical quality improvement scores. So let's spend just a couple minutes talking about the elephant in the room here. COVID-19 and how social determinants of health and patient engagement can make an impact. So with testing and treatment capacity still ramping up to handle our, our entire population, we see efforts being made to target certain populations who are significantly at risk. Typically, these at risk are patients identified by a combination of clinical factors. Say they have COPD and SDOH factors such as living in transient housing and being economically unstable. Finally, SDOH is used to help prepare for a post-COVID world, such as identifying those at risk who are unlikely to come in during a pandemic due to fear of catching the virus. While a portion of these individuals can successfully manage their conditions remotely, Many patients lack the social and economic ability to do so, and will see their health deteriorate as the pandemic goes on. For instance, individuals with housing and economic instability might mean an inability to use telehealth or patient portals for communication and coordination of their health. A focus may be made to treat those patients more closely. Later, third area we want to look at um, within that is how to uh, help manage patients uh, through these disease states. And there are some key things now to look at with the management of the disease states, including the specialties that provide that care for these patients. So we looked at some specific uh, healthcare provider specialties, and we dug into what was happening with them. The key specialty providers included in this model were based on review of relevant market literature and clinical guidance. Key specialties included in the analysis were anesthesiologists, cardiologists, critical care, emergency medicine, essential community providers, hospitalists, hypertension specialists, internal medicine, interventional medicine, infectious disease, pulmonary disease, and respiratory therapists.
in teaching I think we both progressed the slide forward at the same time. Uh, so I'll just take a moment and talk about uh, a little bit of telehealth adoption uh, and then we'll go into a quick um, poll and then go into the survey results. Um, so as we all know, the traditional delivery of health care service has, um, has undergone a significant transformation with the suspension of elective surgeries and temporary closure of offices. Um, in response, many providers have transitioned to using telehealth services for remote patient evaluation, um, diagnosis, treatment. Um, this nationwide expansion has helped communities maintain continuity of care and support social distancing requirements. Um, a lot of these at-risk communities um, and individuals that Sean was just talking about have been able to benefit from vital services that reduce potential care gaps and limit patient exposure. Um, telehealth services have also reduced um, the provider risk by expanding the breadth of practitioners available to those at-risk communities, um, regardless of location, as well as reduce their socioeconomic risk by mitigating some of the factors that might limit accessibility of care. Um, so when we've taken a look at telehealth utilization trends by specialty, um, this is probably not news to anyone on this call, but we've really seen some key areas that have um, had some significant changes and growth in telehealth adoption. Um, some of the key areas we've seen um, consistently over the past year that have just uh, maintained a significant increase in their telehealth utilization um, this past year from the previous year is in gastroenterology, assistive therapy, endocrinology, behavioral care, pediatrics, orthopedic surgery. These are just some of our top um, specialty areas we've looked at. And some of these are to be expected, right? So pediatrics, parents of young children um, and babies were concerned about exposing their kids to COVID, but they have regular annual checkups. And um, certainly when you have a, a young child, uh, you need to be able to bring them to the doctor and feel safe uh, doing so. So they able to conduct their regular visits online uh, via telehealth is more really helpful for them. Increases in behavioral care, also fairly expected. We have a lot of our populations at home and struggling with really unprecedented isolation. Um, but there were some areas that had surprising increases. So orthopedic surgery, for example, saw a spike early on in some of, um, some of which is due to pre and post op appointments and transitioning to telehealth for the first time. Um, consultations are occurring more and more frequently. Um, and endocrinology has seen a consistent growth and shift to telehealth as well, um, which has really opened up uh, care for folks at a higher risk of COVID-19 complications. Uh, Post-pandemic, I, I think we're gonna see some of these trends continue, behaviors are changing. We're all really rethinking how we engage with our healthcare. Um, it's convenient, uh, helps us stay more engaged, more accessible. Um, and so, and there's just certainly, we've seen you know, a spike kind of early in March last year, um, and that kind of dipped down, you can see the graph on, on the slide here. Um, that's really looking at the past year of telehealth trends for these kind of key specialty areas. So uh, it spiked, but it's still around here to stay. Um, so, uh, and certainly some services are gonna transition to back, um, back into office settings, and I think that's gonna make sense, right? A lot of things like, you know, preventative care going to get your mammograms, for example, you're gonna to wanna to go into an office to do that, you have to go into an office setting to do that. Um, but telehealth is uh, really, I think, here to stay. Um, so we'll go to our next polling question before we jump into our survey results. So um, which of the below areas has been a top priority as part of the pandemic response for you and your organization? Um, so we got your you know, answers to the pre-COVID. Post-COVID, has care management and preventative care been more important? Continuity of care through um, alternate places of service, um, so telehealth, ASCs, things like that. Um, mitigating risk for at-risk populations with comorbidities, mitigating risk for populations with socioeconomic risk factors, or ensuring you have enough provider specialties to service the at-risk population. So we'll just give you about um, 10 to 15 seconds here to answer which ones are uh, which one has been the most important for you as part of um, the response to COVID-19? Okay, I'm about to close it out. Any last takers? Okay, next slide. Ah, fairly even split right across the board. Um, I'll respond once if Sean has any thoughts about this. This doesn't surprise me at all um, because I think we know all of these are important, right? Um, care management, preventative care, continuity of care, mitigating risk, I mean, really all of these are important. So um, I'm not surprised at all to see a pretty even spread here. Um, Sean, any other thoughts here before we move into the survey results? I'm there with you, no surprises. Okay, perfect. All right, well, thank you everyone for participating, Sean. I'm just gonna go right to our survey results here. Um, and jump in. So yeah, so this brings us back full circle. So current industry trends are showing us that they're, that knowledge is key. Knowing the who, the where, the costs, and the options can help your business as you plan your product management, your releases, Salesforce engagements, targeting, and outreach. But how can you effectively gain 
this knowledge given the immense number of providers and facilities that you might wish to target? Well, the reality is you need data. Data that can help you understand the value of your product within the industry by looking at the patients, providers, and payers who are using and reimbursing for that data. All right, thank you, Sean. So we really want to understand what data helps payers make informed decisions in the midst of all of these shifting um, trends, right? So uh, we know that U.S. healthcare payers rely uh, heavily on detailed intelligence on providers and healthcare delivery organizations to make informed decisions about entering new markets, designing new products, negotiating contracts, and identifying potential fraud risks and abuse. We also know that in the fierce competitive marketplace, having access to the right competitive intelligence at the right time is crucial. Um, we want to really just understand just what types of data and intelligence payers currently have access to and regularly use, what data is most valuable to make those key decisions, and what intelligence uh, they might not have access to now that they feel would be most useful for them um, to make their, their key business decisions. Um, our team partnered with Healthcare Dive Studio ID to conduct a pulse survey. We received feedback from 107 uh, payer professionals in locally senior management positions. Um, from claims data to remittance data and more, we learned how payers use these types of data and why these types of competitive insights are essential to strategic decision making. So I'm going to go through, I want to say about seven questions that we had asked and to share the results with you. Um, so we asked, what competitive insights do most payers have? So when surveyed about what the competitive intelligence payers have access to in order to make those decisions, we found that I mean, all but 15%, so 85% of payers have access to some level of competitive insight. That's not surprising given the value of claims data. Um, the most common type reported that payers have access to was claims summary level data. Um, but um, I got too much data on the slide here. Um, but even so, more than 40% of payers said they lacked access to that same summary level data. Um, we also found that payers were least likely to have remittance data, with only 38% saying that they had this type of data. Um, why is that an important call out? Um, we know that as payers, you have access to your own remittance data, what you've paid to who, for what, or where. But you often uh, have little to no market metrics to compare it to. So many payers aren't sure if their rates are in line with their competitors' um, remittance data outside of your own plan can provide that line of sight, allow you to engage in better planning. Um, and payers really need to be able to compare their contract costs when they're negotiating and planning. And to do so, you really need to have that full picture of what your competitors' um, contract rates are and how their rates compare um, within the market. Um, you also want to understand how the practitioner's rates are within the market and do they fall within a market norm. And that really, you know, using competitive intelligence can provide a complete market view is really the only way to achieve that. that that large picture here. Um, so overall access to um, the comprehensive competitive insights is crucial to payers. Um, so payers have limited data on payer makeup. So we had asked about um, payer makeup. We said, do you know the payer makeup of each provider, facility, procedure, and or diagnosis in your geography, um, both in and out of network? Uh, and so only 25% of payers um, that we surveyed um, had said that they have access to detailed payer makeup data. And almost one fifth said they had no access to this kind of data. So when you're talking about market expansion and you're trying to coordinate with an ACO, it's really, help, um, it's really helpful to understand what the conditions are in that geography. You want to know that the conditions are relevant. You want to understand the clinical conditions, such as who's doing the most of what certain procedures from the physician facility standpoint, as well as the rate that getting paid. You know, without access to data on payer makeup of these providers, it's really challenging for payers to know whether they have the right providers for their members. It's also difficult for peers to know who the high value physicians and facilities are that they should contract with and what types of provider or facility volumes they can expect from an acquisition or expansion. So it's, it's uh, an important piece. And I think that uh, we were a little surprised to see the low, the low volume of peers that have access to that information. Um, next we talked about, we looked into some specific um, remittance uh, metrics. So we asked um, which of the following external claims rate metrics do you have access to? Um, we asked specifically about remittance data because we just talked about a couple slides ago how important that remittance data is from a, just understanding the broad context of, of the market when you're in there. Um, and we asked about um, billed and charged um, metrics, paid amounts, allowed amounts, paid patient responsibility. And we're looking at competitive remittance data. Um, most payers identified that they do not have access to patient responsibility metrics. That was certainly the lowest one, um, even though they have access to billed and allowed amounts. 
However, patient responsibility data is really an important part of strategic decision making and a lack of insight into this data point can lead to unintended consequences. Um, as we discussed earlier, price transparency is a growing trend in the healthcare space. So with increasing regulation around assuring patients understand their out-of-pocket expenses, you also need to understand their out-of-pocket expenses. So not being able to identify that within your own plan um, or know how that compares with other payers and plans leaves you less prepared for the new regulations. Um, additionally, when you're looking at things from the patient responsibility standpoint, when you're negotiating contracts or designing a product offering, you want to make sure that you're not unintentionally um, disincentivizing members from using a product. So it's important to know what that patient responsibility portion is and to make sure it isn't a disincentive for them to utilize important care. Uh, and overall, remittance data provides really a crucial starting point to determine whether a network expansion or new product design is viable for you. So without this type of um, data, payers are making decisions with an incomplete picture, making it difficult to know if the decisions are on target within the of their population. So I'm going to go into the four kind of main strategic decisions that benefit from industry-wide claims um, intelligence and then share the questions and results that we found from um, these specific areas. So those four key areas are contract negotiations, network expansion, new product offerings, and detecting fraud, waste, and abuse. Those are the four that we really um, dove into in, in the survey. So as far as contract negotiations, So to improve contract negotiations, what competitive intelligence would be most helpful to have? Um, so every pair wants to negotiate effectively so that they aren't overpaying for services. They can attract the right mix of facilities and practitioners. You can close the deal as quickly as possible. Um, it's also how you develop the right plan, the right price for your network and region, and having the right data to assure your contract meets these needs is imperative. Um, when we asked about this, the top three responses were meeting competitors' contracted rates um, the view of established market metrics and success criteria for performance measurement, and key metrics such as the max, min, median, and standard deviation for the charge allowed and paid amounts by um, codes. We also had asked about code level intelligence of what procedures could cost for a line of business, the global view of how much a provider would cost your line of business over time, and provider volumes of services. But when it comes to contract negotiations, it was pretty clear that really just understanding what's happening in the market was most important um, for that. So on to network expansion. When we asked about network expansion, uh, payers identified the most valuable insights are patient volumes, reimbursement rates, and line of business and payer makeup. Um, we asked about facility data, number and types of providers, diagnosis and procedures performed in key referral relationships. But when it really comes to expanding a network or looking at an acquisition opportunity, um, patient volumes, reimbursement, and line of business makeup were really important. Um, to the payers that responded to the survey. Um, we know that fierce competition exists in every market, meaning healthcare payer executives want to have a comprehensive view of the market before they make any move to expand, either organically or through an acquisition. This requires having a view of everything from reimbursement rates to, payer, uh, to patient volumes and lines of business and payer makeup. So to expand market share by offering specialty services, payers need to know where gaps exist and who can fill them, right? So having access to data both submitted and remitted data gives payers valuable information on volume and location of services performed that can help you identify key positions um, that you might want to recruit into your network. When you're looking at network expansion, payers often look to fill an existing gap with certain kinds of specialists. So by looking at your own medical claims, you're going to have some blind spots there because you don't have specialists, you know, you're not going to see the specialists that you really don't have anywhere in network and that your, your consumers are not seeing. So um, when you're expanding into a new region, um, if your current consumers aren't receiving care in that region, you have a blind spot when you're entering in that region, right? So um, a payer, you might not see a specialist at all, or you won't see the specialist for full workload across payers to accurately assess fit for your network, kind of depending on your situation. Um, using external claims data, so the data that includes other payers, um, you can see additional positions or locations you might want to bring in network based on their volume of care, their network, and the affiliations between them, which is really valuable when you're assessing a specialist expansion. So who kind of naturally works together from a specialist perspective. Um, and then when you're looking at acquisitions, reimbursement rates uh, is crucial to assessing the potential return on investment. Um, likewise, it's important for risk sharing agreements to understand whether your potential partners, volumes, procedures, and breadth of specialty are sufficient to meet your needs. Um, and then when you're looking to enter a new market, payers need to know what services can be provided to meet that new member base's needs. Um, payers need to know who in the new area provides the necessary services, how much they perform, they need to move quickly. You often need to move quickly in closing deals and ensure you have the right mix of providers and services. Um, for payers who are growing and expanding into new states, 
you know that your ability to analyze the market matters a lot. You have to assemble the right blend of oncologists, radiologists, hospitals and outpatient clinics, and everything else. So you can provide all the services you need to provide. It's a lot of contracting. Um, and having the volume data along with pricing and network affiliation data and not volume of business data can really make your negotiation process faster. Um, so heading into new product offerings. Uh, so payers are extremely interested in great in generating new revenue sources through innovative new product and service development. Um, so we asked when designing your products or offerings, which of these is most important to the organization. We had asked about com competition rates, current product utilization, um, penetration in the market of value-based contracts, utilization by setting of care, geography variation, provider specialty makeup, and network coverage gaps. Um, the top responses are here on the screen. So we've got network coverage gaps was our most frequent. Current product utilization um, was pretty much right on par there, and then utilization by setting of care. Um, so while pair executives indicated they frequently use a number of those different insights, so I listed a bunch of them, um, these are really the top three that kind of stood out um, from the survey, the results here. And the right product with the right coordination with providers not only allows payers to manage people's health effectively to improve their health condition, but can also be financially beneficial um, for you as a business. Yet yeah, successful product design requires a clear view of the community needs within a target market. Um, payers have to ensure not only that your members have access to the right practitioners and facilities, but much needed ancillary support services, right? And also that your contact rates are within range that will allow the product to be financially successful. Um, payers need to know what the prominent conditions are in that area they want to go into. Are you, uh, are you aligned with what the people uh, are going to need? Can they get in at a competitive rate? And will they be able to make sure the patient responsibility portion isn't under consented for members to utilize this important care? Um, it's also vital that payers understand what the typical clinical conditions are in a particular territory. So an example here is if diabetes is the number one chronic condition um, in an area and congestive heart failure is the number 10 condition, a payer who's considering adding a new center of excellence for cardiac care, which is a new endocrinology practice, you know, knowing the volume for the population as a whole not just within your network, but as a, as a whole, um, may influence your decision between the two design choices. Um, so when you're designing a new product, you know, it really requires a complete understanding of the community at large, not just your own consumer metrics, um, in order to create a more enticing product offering. So even the largest payers are never going to have enough claims in a given market to, you know, and to truly really understand what's occurring there, you really need outside data to make those decisions. All right, now going to our fourth um, area on our last question that we had on our, on our survey um, is around detecting fraud, waste, and abuse. So the National um, Healthcare Anti-Fraud Association estimates that the financial losses due to healthcare fraud are in the tens of billions of dollars each year, um, or conservatively 3% of total healthcare expenditures. Um, reducing fraud, waste, and abuse, um, or sometimes known as FWA, can help improve payers' bottom line as well as help bring down the cost of healthcare for everyone. Um, so we asked, we asked the question of when detecting fraud, waste, and abuse, which of these is most important to your organization? Uh, we asked, we had five choices here. So we had atypical billing behavior, high volumes for services, referral patterns, provider specialty anomalies, and irregular treatment patterns. Um, overwhelmingly, our respondents said that they, you know, what was most helpful for them is looking at atypical billing behavior. Um, but still 60% or right around that high volume of services um, and irregular treatment. So while payers can use their plan data to identify atypical billing behaviors, um, including high volumes of service or regular treatment, a payer's data provides only a small window into provider's overall behavior. So for example, a provider might bill for a high volume of services, but if it's done across a number of plans, it, it's going to be more difficult to identify that the provider has billed for, let's say, 40 hours of services within a 24-hour time frame. If you're only seeing you know, a slice of that provider's care come into your, um, your database, right? you're going to miss that full picture of kind of the risk that that provider has to, to your organization. But when you collectively look at their, their claim um, among all of those pairs, you would see that that doctor has more transactional claims than is possible in 24 hours. Um, and it might pass each individual payer's lens without a red flag, right? Um, similarly, a rules engine might flag a practitioner for, practitioner for atypical billing behaviors, um, such as a podiatrist billing for mammograms or a doctor who's billing for services outside of their area of expertise. However, without a broader lens into that provider's behavior across multiple plans, it might be difficult to identify how great a source of risk they are for the plan. If the payer doesn't have access to that broader set of data, they're not going to be as proficient as they could be at finding fraud, waste, and abuse in-house. 
So to identify potential risks and make the most of investigative efforts, um, special investigative units will be most successful when they have complete market view of a provider's activity and billing practices, both within their plan and outside of their plan. Um, so that brings me to our final poll question. Um, so which area of your business would benefit most in your mind from you know, industry claims insights? So we reviewed um, contract and rate negotiation, expansion and acquisition, network and product design, fraud, waste and abuse, and risk detection. Um, something else or another idea? Just let us know kind of what the top one is um, for you guys. We're just curious to see how it aligns with um, the survey that we had, had the, the, the poll survey that we conducted. Now, I'll give you about 10 seconds for that, and then we'll go through the results. And then I will pass it over to Sean to close this out and then open up the Q&A. Right. Five more seconds for any last minute takers for this poll. All right. All right. So I got them seeing a pretty split um, and fairly split across the board here, but really the, the most common area of interest for the competitive insights it looks like is contracting and rate negotiation. Um, so I, I'll just say quickly and we'll, before we move on is that from my perspective, this is not terribly surprising, right? Because, you know, when you're looking at designing your own product, we know that payers often are looking at their own in-house metrics, but when you're looking at how to contract, there is that really big blind spot of we don't know if we fit within the rest of the market and what those you know norms are and what that range is min to max um, and what the patient responsibility is and how are we going to really design the right price for our own plan. So um, not terribly surprising, but certainly um, you know, can't count out the other areas too because they have just as much um, interest here. So uh, Sean, do you have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I think on the contracting and rate negotiation, uh, as, as payers have their own level of insight into their business, uh, you had alluded to it earlier, Rebecca, that having a broader landscape of what is happening across all payers will help in this contracting and rate negotiation space. Thank you, everyone, for the polls. We'll have Sean close the out. There we go. Uh, so, as we mentioned, uh, the players or the payers have access, and it, it's often used internally for, for very valid uh, business decisions. But looking at the holistic view of, of the market in general allows you to bring in far more insights. Now, with new data sources coming on from uh, Centers uh, for Medicare and Medicaid, um, the hospital transparency rule, there will be a lot more data opening up uh, for all to consume. Although they will be lacking some key metrics uh, that the rule doesn't cover for. And solely looking at your own claims again um, will enable you to miss some of those crucial components that will allow you to be competitive when you're contracting, expanding, designing, or assessing fraud, waste, and abuse. Um, so getting a, a better understanding of that entire market will help you uh, become um, far more competitive. There are some that are doing this right now in the payer world. Um, and this leaves organizations that are not in that space at a significant disadvantage especially because the payers with the breadth and the depth and the intelligence are able to make those strategic decisions. So we have said this before, and uh, I guess in summary, the success of your organization truly demands data and more than just in-house data or in-network data from your existing members, providers, facilities, treatment trends, referral patterns and rates, Success demands the right data, which includes network and external industry claims intelligence. Competitive claims intelligence provides the clarity you need to succeed in an evolving marketplace. So as in summary, the healthcare industry will continue to morph, payers will continuously be challenged to remain innovative, responsive, and competitive. Um, we believe that 
success demands data. And we'd be happy to talk to you in more detail about uh, those three pillars of the data stool that we talk about, volumes, networks, and reimbursements. Um, but I would like to give us time to answer questions. So I will bring us to the Q&A session. And open it up to Chima to provide questions from our audience. Okay, so, so we're now at our portion. I think we got some feedback. But we're now at our Q&A portion. I do want to give you guys an opportunity to go ahead and submit your uh, questions as we begin to open up the, the floor for questions. So. Go ahead and start. Um, <clears throat> first question, are APMs more prevalent in certain specialties? Sean, did you have any thoughts on this one from your experience? I think so we, we can definitely dig into that in more detail. Uh, I don't have the metrics in front of me for which specialties are higher for for uh, which alternative payment models right now. We will provide details to this offline, though, as we dig into the data we have in-house. Okay. Next question. Uh, can you help my plan understand which geograph geographies we should expand into or what network should we look like if we're if i'm considering managing new populations like medicaid i'll take this for a second and Sean, jump in if you have anything you want to add to this um certainly medical claims both submitted and from the remitted side would really help you understand um certain geographies you can break um, you know, this type of data out into national, you can break it out by state, you can break it out by region, you can look at it by, you know, zip three if you want to. Um, you can also break it out by lines of business. Um, so we have found that payers really um, find this to be a valuable um, key way of looking at the, the medical claims. Um, so instead of looking at it just by who the payer is, but looking at it by that line of business, that we're looking at commercial, Medicaid, Medicare, um, you know, TRICARE, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can look at um, line of business here, but we found that that's the payers that we've worked with really find that to be very helpful, um, both in managing kind of their own current plan, um, as well as looking at how they want to expand. And certainly would be help, um, we're willing to do something like a sample, um, if that's something someone would be interested in, so just certainly reach out to one of us. Tell me more about how claims data will help me determine the best product mix. How does it do that? Well, I think if you look at whether you have a, a geographical bias in uh, the disease states that you're managing to with your providers, or if you have a new and emerging um, condition that, that you're trying to manage for, you know, as we saw COVID roll out across the country, uh, facilities were shutting down. And, you know, there, it was hard to stay on top of a trend like that. Looking at things like real-time uh, four-day-old claims data that is non-geographically biased across multiple areas can help you know how to move and, and shift your business quickly. But strategically, I think you can look at where populations are growing over time where they're aging, where they have social economic uh, conditions that need to be treated, otherwise it is going to affect you because of readmit rates. Um, those are all things that we can tease out of the data uh, longitudinally. And, and one thing I wanted to point out, and while I don't have all of the statistics in front of me, and, and I, I prefer to have a broader picture, you know, as you think about things like the bundled payments that are out there right now, uh, total joints and hips replacements and things like that, being able to understand where that next um, specialty is playing, uh, orthopedic surgery, et cetera, 
uh, will help you be able to answer how you manage those markets in the future. Okay. Do you have an estimate of how much more competitive my pricing slash contracting might be with external data? Well, I think one of the things that's evident is that you can see what the payer landscape looks like. Um, you can see whether you are competitive based on that insight alone. Uh, you can also see if you have areas um, that are potentially at risk with with high rates of denials. Uh, there might be physicians that are in your environment that have a higher level of patient volume that, that have that. So there are things that you can use within the data to become more competitive. Um, it would take some time just for us to ask, you know, look at some of your specific business questions and see where those data uh, insights can apply but as Rebecca mentioned, we'd be happy working with you, giving you some uh, sample insights as to how this could apply to you, because we really believe it will be valuable in helping you manage your business. And then I'm going to just jump on that, Sean, real quick. Um, real quick, too, much, sorry. Um, oh. We recently had a um, put out an infographic um, that, you know, I, I'd like to see if we can find a way to point you guys to, because we looked at, um, you know, a couple of payers for like one procedure, which was one procedure like knee replacement um, for uh, across like three different payers across four different states. And when we looked at it without breaking out by lines of business, you, know, you could you kind of have one picture of what's happening for like payer A, B, and C. But when you break it out by line of business, you start to see, well, in the commercial space, that was where one of our payers was really um, – you know, contracting much higher um, than their peers. Um, and so being able to have that information would help them to be able to contract moving forward to say, well, I'm really out of, um, you know, I'm really not within the norm within this region for this procedure, um, for this line of business for my commercial payment. Um, where without that line of business breakout across Medicare, Medi Medicaid, commercial, all the lines of business, you know, there's a little bit less variance. So once you broke it up by that line, by that line of business, you really saw that variance. Um, and you would be able to really say, well, if you reduce your, you know, payment for that knee procedure and multiply by the number of individuals in that region that get knee procedure, it would be a pretty quick um, quick way to estimate some return on investment from, um, you know, having that kind of insight. So certainly something, again, we're happy to um, work with you on understanding your business needs and questions. Um, but there's a lot to do in this space um, here with the data. data. And as Rebecca mentioned, we'll, uh, if you haven't seen that infographic yet, we'd be happy to share it with anyone that wants it. Does your data show me what specific payers charge certain prices? Uh, I think that's a, it's a great question. I think it's a very simple and quick answer since we're running out of time here is yes. Uh, we can look at what specific payers are charging certain prices. We can do it by lines of business. Um, you know, we can do it by region. Um, and we certainly can work with you to understand kind of how we do our payer mapping and how we standardize payer names because there's a lot of different types of um, payer names out there. So certainly just reach out to us if you have any questions about this. Um, I know we're coming up on time here. But thank you yeah, for your participation. Yeah, thank you, guys. One more question. Can you tell me my most expensive providers based on the, off this information? Yes, yeah, so we'll be able to see what was submitted and remitted for those providers. Hey guys, thank you uh, for joining uh, this uh, event today. And this now concludes our, our presentation. Just want to thank Rebecca and Sean uh, for presenting to us today. So thank you guys and have a great day. Thank you all. And thank you everyone for having us.